Good morning, everyone, and thank you all for joining us. And a special thank you to Dr. Charles Anderson for joining us uh, here to today to present a diagnostic pathway for wound-related cellulitis. After Dr. Anderson's presentation, there will be a short Q&A. So if you have any questions, find your chat icon and put any questions that you might have for Dr. Anderson into the chat, and we'll try and get through as many as we can. And so now I'm just delighted to hand this over to Dr. Charles Anderson, uh, who is Chief Vascular Endovascular Limb Preservation Surgery Service uh, at, at Madigan Army Medical Center. Good morning, Dr. Anderson, and welcome. Good morning, Monique. So as mentioned, my name is Chuck Anderson. I'm a vascular surgeon by trade. I've been at Madigan Army Medical Center for uh, uh, greater than 30 years. We have a very active limb preservation program at Madigan uh, where we have uh, vascular surgery, advanced podiatric care, and a large wound care presence uh, with the goal of preventing amputations uh, in diabetic patients. I currently am the uh, director of the wound care clinic where we see all kinds of wounds. The fluorescent uh, scanning for bacteria is now a critical part of our wound care practice. Having that ability, point of care, ability to detect greater than 10 to the fourth bacteria has modified our wound care and uh, a very significant percentage of our patients as reported now by many different uh, centers. Uh, this morning, we're gonna talk about an extension of that ability to fluoresce for bacteria. What we have uh, determined and recently reported is that using the, the uh, scanning for bacteria, we're able to diagnose wound-related cellulitis. You have the next slide, please. So, a little bit of a disclaimer, uh, I work for the uh, uh, U.S. Army Department of Defense, and anything I say today is my opinion and not the opinion of uh, the U.S. Army. And this information is uh, meant for general information, does not constitute uh, professional advice. Next slide. So what is wound-related cellulitis? Uh, we know that uh, wounds uh, can have a significant bacterial burden. In a percentage of patients, what occurs is that bacteria starts to migrate, migrate from the wound into the adjacent tissue, leading to uh, cellulitis. Uh, if unchecked, obviously, that uh, cellulitis uh, can continue to progress and cause serious problems. The interesting thing is that the, the classic signs and symptoms of cellulitis uh, are many times not present in these patients with early uh, wound-related cellulitis. So the characteristic uh, erythema, warmth, tenderness, edema, uh, oftentimes are not present. And the other thing is that many of the other conditions that we treat, for example, stasis dermatitis, and can masquerade, you can uh, have erythema and uh, and that can look like cellulitis. So misdiagnosis uh, can occur in up to 30% of the patients. Next slide. So, so the, uh, the consequences, uh, if you have that bacteria that's extended into the adjacent tissue, uh, that can obviously spread. So this particular uh, image is a, an image of a pressure ulcer. If that goes unchecked, that obviously can cause a significant significant infection, even uh, into the bone causing osteomyelitis. I was recently at SAWC last week, and uh, it was uh, a very interesting session where they uh, indicated that 160,000 patients a year die from sepsis associated with pressure increase. So anything we can do to stop that progression. On the other hand, uh, sometimes said, uh, Diagnosis of cellulitis is, uh, is based strictly on clinical criteria, may be overdiagnosed, leading to unnecessary hospitalization, unnecessary antibiotics. So to have a tool that can help us appropriately and accurately diagnose wound-related cellulitis is critical. Next slide. 
So th this is uh, the device uh, that uh, we use. Uh, it uh, does not require any kind of an injection and is able to detect, uh, as you've heard in other presentations this morning, uh, greater than 10 to the fourth uh, bacteria uh, with a red or cyan signal, signal indicating uh, bacteria. As you can see in the image, again, the pressure ulcer and the adjacent picture, you can see fluorescence uh, not only in the wound, but extending into the adjacent tissue. Uh, next slide. So how can we use the uh, imaging to support the diagnosis? So this is uh, our study. We've now uh, in our clinic uh, scanned uh, almost uh, uh, five, uh, 500 uh, patients, uh, and many of those patients multiple times. So this, uh, this is a study of 236 patients uh, that we analyzed. We looked at the clinical presentation and we looked at uh, what our plan was uh, based on clinical criteria alone. We looked at how that plan was modified uh, on the basis of the scan. And then we looked for evidence of extension of that fluorescence outside of the wound. Uh, so that uh, 15 of 236 patients, 6.4%, we diagnosed with wound-related cellulitis. Uh, many of these patients did not have many of the classic signs or symptoms, and in one patient, absolutely no clinical signs or symptoms of uh, cellulitis. You can see it was a, a, a many different kinds of ulcers. Uh, all of these patients were then followed up, and uh, we'll get to that in just a minute. Next slide. So this this is our pathway. Uh, so with all of our patients, we, we make the decision uh, whether or not they're, they're, they are a candidate for a scan, uh, if they are, uh, based on criteria in another paper that, uh, uh, that we have uh, taken part in. Then we'll go ahead and scan. If the scan is positive for bacteria, then we attempt to remove that bacteria with the uh, debridement of the wound and cleansing of the skin around the wound. Next slide. So you, you can see an image here with a lot of fluorescence. Uh, however, this after thorough cleansing, uh, the fluorescence was removed. So this is surface colonization. This is not cellulitis. And this is something that uh, we would not uh, treat as cellulitis and we would uh, just Go ahead with, with our standard of care. Next slide. Uh, this is a patient that uh, obviously has a callus and a wound. Uh, the image shows fluorescence around that callus. Uh, so that's a callus that uh, we would debride, trying to remove as much of that fluorescence as possible. And then go ahead, then go ahead with the uh, treatment of that ulcer. So this is not cellulitis. Next slide. So this is an image, uh, again, showing a, a chronic venous ulcer. You can see that there, there is uh, some maceration, induration of the skin around that. Uh, how much uh, bacterial burden is associated with that wound? It's very hard to determine based on clinical criteria alone. Uh, then you uh, see the scan and there's not only bacteria in that wound, but you see that fan-like extension of bacteria into the skin and subcutaneous tissue around the wound. And that is what we refer to as wound-related cellulitis. So just to note that this is a very specific kind of cellulitis. This is wound-related cellulitis. Uh, in a patient that shows up in the emergency room with a wet, with a red swollen leg and, and no wound, uh, using uh, the scanning device it, it may not uh, pick up cellulitis at all. So this is diagnosis of wound-related cellulitis, extension of that bacteria into the adjacent tissue. Next slide. 
So th this is another example. You can, you can see the wound. You can see the outline of a dressing that's been over that wound with some erythema because there's uh, erythema just in the area of the uh, dressing. Could it be a reaction to the dressing? Is there is that moisture? What the, uh, the scan demonstrates is, uh, again, bacteria. Uh, that could not be removed by thorough cleansing. So this is a patient that we did go ahead and put on a sharp course of oral antibiotics uh, that cleared up very rapidly. Uh, the patient went on, as you can see in, in the uh, next image, uh, progressing on with no further evidence of uh, bacteria and healed the wound very promptly. Uh, next slide. So what does all of this mean? How do we use this? So the, the uh, clinical signs and symptoms of infection are unreliable in making the diagnosis of wound-related cellulitis. Uh, you may over-diagnose it and certainly under-diagnose wound-related cellulitis. That consistent pattern of the red fluorescence extending beyond the wound was present in all of our cases. So all of these cases were subsequently followed. In all cases, the fluorescence has subsided in usually one to two weeks. Uh, none of those patients uh, required hospitalization. None of those patients uh, required IV antibiotics. And all of those patients went on to uh, heal their wounds in a very timely fashion. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to discuss this. Uh, we recently uh, published this work in the International Journal uh, of Wound Care and are uh, excited about the ability to diagnose wound-related cellulitis. Thank you so much, Dr. Anderson. Such, a, such an interesting study. If anyone has questions, they can go and put them into the chat feature of this. But I want to get us started. I'm interested in this last point about no patients requiring in IV antibiotics and the, the role that that has in stewardship. How about the other 200 plus patients who were not diagnosed with wound-associated cellulitis? Has there been an impact on your antibiotic prescribing in those patients? Absolutely. So those patients that have fluorescence limited to the wound, it's very rare that we would put any of those patients on an antibiotic. So the ability to tell whether the bacteria is just focal within the wound, where you can address it with the breedment and the appropriate wound care products, that would be the treatment without the use of antibiotics. So yes, uh, it has decreased uh, our uh, use of antibiotic. And it also has tailored our use of antimicrobial dressings. If there's bacteria in a wound, then we're going to use an antimicrobial dressing. If there's not bacteria in a wound, then that, that decreases the need and the usage of antibacterial dressings. And how about, given, given that you have such a strong focus on limb preservation, do you think that this will have any impact uh, on your limb preservation efforts at Madigan and, and potentially elsewhere? Uh, Yes, absolutely. It's interesting. We, we did originally a Delphi consensus looking at, at the, the usage of fluorescence uh, for bacteria. And one of the questions we asked the individuals involved in that study is whether or not they felt it had decreased uh, or contributed to decreasing the amputation rate. And almost uniformly, uh, the individuals felt, as I do, that it plays a role in early an appropriate treatment of infection and thus can decrease the uh, uh, amputation. If, if you look at uh, diabetic foot ulcers, for example, and we manage a lot of diabetic foot ulcers, the two factors that take a diabetic foot ulcer from just an ulcer to amputation, one is infection. So if you can identify early bacterial burden treated early before you get a, an infection, and the second is vascular insufficiency. And our model where we have uh, vascular studies and intervention immediately available has been, uh, again, paramount in decreasing amputation. 
That, that's exciting to hear. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Anderson. And uh, I'll wrap up this session uh, by reminding everyone that Dr. Anderson's study is now published in the International Wound Journal. Uh, so you can, uh, you can go and find that there. And then also I'll remind about another presentation happening this afternoon from Dr. Thomas Serena with an enticing title, Report Card on US-Based Antimicrobial Prescribing, A Failing Grade. So we'll hear about more about that this afternoon and I welcome you all to, to join back for that. Um, oh, oh wait, I do see one, a question has come in. Um, has Moleculite ever been used to identify peri-wound contamination not fully removed prior to surgical closures uh, with or without uh, seven day dressing for prevention of surgical site infections? Dr. Anderson, do you wanna comment on, on a role in surgical site infections? So I, to me, that question has uh, two major po points. So we work very, very closely with our plastic surgeons and the ability to, to scan a wound and look for bacteria can then help you direct uh, your wound care. For example, if we have bacteria in a wound, we're not gonna use a skin substitute. We're not gonna put on a split thick skin graft and we will delay any kind of a flat procedure. So we know when we're doing a procedure, it's a clean wound. Now, once we do a procedure, uh, there's still a risk for uh, surgical site infections. And uh, this uh, modality has a role for monitoring uh, those incisions post-procedure. Uh, I have a very, very interesting case that uh, uh, in one of our limb preservation patients uh, had uh, reconstructive uh, procedure on his diabetic foot, had hardware implanted, returned with uh, uh, an incision that uh, looked suspicious for uh, some breakdown and not obviously infected, but uh, we uh, scanned that and uh, there was significant fluorescence uh, in the lower part of that incision. Uh, we made a open a part of that incision, drained some purulence, uh, irrigated that out, put on uh, because he had hardware not exposed, but underneath that incision, uh, we went ahead and used not only antimicrobial dressings, but a sharp course of antibiotics that will heal up fine with uh, no spread of that infection to the hardware. And when, when you're dealing with wounds with hardware, that, that's, uh, that's really critical to be able to pick up early surgical site infections and manage those early. Great question. Agreed, a great question. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Anderson, and thank you all for attending. Hope to see you at Dr. Serena's presentation this afternoon. Uh, have, a, have a great WoundCon, everyone. Thank you.